Kelly Burnett. I'm a communications coordinator with the Digital Workshop Center. See some familiar faces. So thank you for being here and attending. Um, we've got a short presentation here for you that Stu Crayer, our training director, will be um, presenting. And I'll pass it on to him. This is a topic that's near and dear to me because I do a lot of the hiring for DWC, and I've actually talked to a couple of you, I think, um, recently. So, um, you know, this is something that uh, I really always want to share my thoughts on and, and help people. Um, I think that's you know, the motivation for this is uh, for all of our students. We're always very career driven here at the Digital Workshop Center. We want to help people find new careers and extend their existing careers. So. This is just one small piece of that puzzle. Um, just a couple notes, you know, we are gonna record this. So if you do wanna watch it later, we will certainly make that available to you. And the presentation will also be available as a PDF and Allie will help uh, get you both of those pieces if you need them. Um, so give me one sec, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, this topic, uh, about it's about a 30 minute talk and then uh, about a 15 minute time for a Q and A and, conversation. Um, so I, I like to call this, you know, how to create a winning resume. Um, and I just really want to kind of start with some overview things and we're going to dive into a lot of specifics. Um, we're going to leave the chat window open as well. So you know, please go ahead and throw your questions in there should they come up as I'm talking and Allie will help to moderate that. And then I will certainly try to address everything that comes up there um, as well. So um, without further ado, let's go right into it here. Uh, you know, first of all, for those of you that don't know who we are, um, as an occupational school uh, here in Colorado, we've been here um, since 2006. Uh, we do serve students all across the U.S. We're um, through the Department of Higher Ed in Colorado and Utah, um, but we also work with so many other states. And our job here um, is filling in the role of really what I would consider non-traditional education, helping people uh, move forward in the workforce. And we really live by the mission of empowering you with skills and not degrees. And when you look at your resume, we're gonna talk about skills here in just a second about how important that is. Uh, and that's really our job is to help upskill you and make sure that you're comfortable uh, getting confident with these skills. Um, the way that we do that, we always have live training um, we've focused on that for almost 15 years. It's very experiential style of training, very hands-on, and our classes are kept very small as well so that you really get a lot of personal attention, support, and mentoring throughout every program um, that we offer here. Um, so we work with a lot of uh, veterans. We have different grants that are available through uh, occupational schools uh, in uh, several states as well as voc uh, vocational, re uh, vocational rehabilitation, if I can say that, uh, and some other programs that we work with. Uh, my role here is as training director uh, of the Digital Workshop Center um, includes doing all the hiring. Okay, so you know, right now we have over 20 uh, instructors that are on, um, on our, our team. Um, we have a, a staff of three here running the office. Um, and so I see a lot of resumes. Uh, we have pretty constant um, ads out there on Indeed and other places for uh, instructors. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of, I'd say weekly reviewing quite a few resumes. So I, I see a lot of them. I, I think um, I can uh, definitely give you my advice and my best practices about what someone like myself is looking for. And, you know, that's really where this talk is kind of rooted out of. Um, so I you know, want to talk about just hiring in general. And you know, when you look at hiring um, from a skills-based perspective, it might change your way of thinking, not only as the applicant, but also as someone like myself, as a hiring manager or recruiter. I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. So you'll, you'll hear me say that language a lot. But um, a couple of key things to think about here, first of all. Okay, so... A lot of people get hung up on needing degrees. When we talk about skills-based hiring, I think you just look at the general economy. And just uh, two years ago with this study from Georgetown University, you know, there are over 30 million jobs in this country alone that pay uh, an average of $55,000 a year that do not require a four-year degree. 
there are many studies, countless studies that would show you that having additional skills on your resume and really technical skills in this particular slide are going to increase your overall compensation. They're going to make you more attractive to employers. And I think it's kind of obvious, but maybe worth saying that in today's world, you know, tech skills permeate into every single um, career field out there. So, you know, for you to really be competitive and to be someone who's going to be considered seriously for a position, um, you know, of any of the ones that we teach, and I think, you know, practically any uh, position today, especially with the COVID situation, you know, technology is a huge part of the skills that people want. So our job here, again, as a school is to rethink about how we can deliver that to you. So we work with a lot of education providers and um, programs and employers. And so we're really trying to think about, well, what makes the hiring process um, work for our students? How can we help our students be better prepared for that? So when we think about skills-based hiring and then we think about the four-year degree, Okay, that would be maybe what we, we would lump under traditional hiring practices. Traditionally, going back, you know, however many years, um, a lot of positions uh, within technology would say, I, I need that before your degree first, and then look for very specific skills after that. Well, 67% of the U.S. population today doesn't even have a four-year degree. And so many years back, probably 10 plus years back, people started looking at hiring a little differently and saying, well, hold on a second. Are the degrees really what matter or are the skills what matters? And ultimately people decided, I think kind of a, the collective movement of, of hiring individuals that we wanted to start looking at skills-based hiring practices. So there's a great uh, organization here called Skillful. It's actually based out of Colorado, but they, they are all across the country. Uh, and they work closely with LinkedIn and many other organizations. And they're trying to constantly educate employers about the skills-based hiring. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, now when people think about hiring, they say, well, you know, almost 83% of hiring managers would rather focus on skills than background because so many people who are, you know, not able to get a four-year degree or maybe have a degree that doesn't exactly uh, associate to the skills, they might be weeded out by the traditional hiring practices. And so what we think about here, the first time we look at a resume is to really think about how the entire process of hiring has changed dramatically in the last 10 plus years. So your job is to highlight the skills and look at how you can be a part of this hiring process. And I think the more we understand that process, just in general, uh, the easier it is to kind of play the game that's being played just a little bit when you're, when you're involved. Okay, so I get a lot of questions when I work with potential students or I do career coaching uh, workshops. And one of the first things is people say, well, I, I feel like I'm too old and I can't get, um, I can't compete with younger talent. Other people say, well, I, you know, I have things in my past that are, have come up in, you know, maybe some criminal records and I don't think I'll be able to be competitive. Um, I mean, I can never sit there and say that those wouldn't factor into it, but I can honestly say that most hiring managers have gotten away from looking at those things first. Those are not um, something that they would weigh on in terms of you being a good candidate. What they wanna see on your resume are skills. They wanna see that you have the experience and the skills to bring to the table here. Okay, so with that in mind and understanding maybe just a little bit more that you know the, the game has changed uh, in so many recent years, let's look at the specifics of what makes a winning resume for you. So the first thing, maybe again, just kind of really obvious, but uh, looking at it from a general perspective is to, to ask the question, you know, what is a resume and why do we still use this system, right? You know, this has been around for a long time. There's a reason why people like this. Okay, well, number one, it should be a summary of your career. Career being the key word here. Everyone has specific personal activities and hobbies and interests that you're involved in. That's not necessarily what the resume is about. That makes you an interesting person, absolutely. But we want to look at your career and be able to summarize that and highlight your past and your current jobs 
and responsibilities. I think that's maybe even the more key word is because people want to know what you were able to uh, accomplish in the past and why you'd be able to be trusted with that in the future. The resume is really an opportunity for you to tailor your story to the specific role or the company. Okay. Um, um, oh, okay. So let me move this around here just a little bit. Um, okay. Oops. Yes, I had my uh, controls up there. Um, so when employers look at um, what they want to see on a resume, or they talk about what they want to see on a resume, you kind of break it down to some really simple questions, okay? And remember, simplicity is always a wonderful thing here, and we'll talk more about that in a second too. But first of all, you need to answer these questions. What did you do? How did, why did you do it? And what was the result? If your resume can't answer that to an employer, you're completely missing the mark, and they're going to move on to the next person. So put yourself in the shoes of a hiring manager or recruiter for a second, okay? Hiring managers see a huge number of resumes, especially today with everything being digital and it's much easier to get a resume for people to deliver it, okay? So your, your general guideline here should be that you need to answer these three questions in 10 seconds. And if your head kind of hurts just thinking about that and saying, well, I don't know, how could I possibly do that? Um, you do that by really speaking in short um, phrases and really thinking about who's reading on the other end to catch their attention. The idea of the resume as a whole is to really paint a picture of who you are. You want to use this maybe as a business card for yourself, like it's a good way to think about it sometimes. And then save your full story about, you know, your life story and your professional life story for the interview. Okay, so remember these three questions are all that you should be answering on the resume. Now, when you start writing your resume, there's a couple of things I think that are extremely helpful to know um, before you, you know, go wasting too much of your time. Okay, well, number one, you have to know the jobs you're going after. If you know the target, you know the goal of what you're going after, you can kind of reverse engineer this a little bit. And you can look at um, what keywords of your resume are going to target the very specific postings that you're going after. Because it's very common that you're probably going to go after different jobs, including different titles or specific roles or industries, you really have to have different resumes for different situations. You can't just use the same resume over and over for the same reason of the first two bullet points here. The keywords are gonna continually change. Your resume needs to be one page. There are very few exceptions where two pages would be okay or more. And I would say that's usually when you get to like a C-level type of position or something. But even in that scenario, I mean, it's, it's pretty rare. I think most people want to have this very condensed look at you answering those those simple questions we just had on the previous slide so one page is key that you are kind of following that i'd also say it's kind of just like an industry standard um and while you know those kinds of things are meant to be broken the if you go back to the point i was saying about how um, recruiters are getting a huge number of these resumes well they just don't have time to read a multi-page page uh, resume they want to look at yours and be able to just make a quick assessment of are you someone they want to talk to and, you know, last thing I'll say, is there something that makes you unique? And remember, we're talking about professionally. And sometimes there's a little bit of a blurry line between your professional and hobby and interest and all that. But is there something that can separate you from the pack in terms of what you can bring to the table and bring to the value of this particular company? Okay. So there's a um, kind of ongoing fight that you should be ready to uh, wage war against here, which is understanding and fighting against the ATS. The ATSs of the world stand for the Applicant Tracking Systems. 
because all resumes are submitted online, applicant tracking systems are what are going to actually identify resumes that match first. And how do they do that? Keywords. Okay, so that's why we start with keywords because everything is automated first. So let's just take the scenario of a hiring manager. Okay, they're putting out a job posting with specific keywords in that post. If you don't hit on those keywords, you're not going to even get in front of the person who put out the post because these applicant tracking systems are going to narrow down who is eligible uh, or who's a good fit, I should say, before you even get in front of someone who might have the manual review that you're looking for. Okay, so the keywords are so important for you to hit on. And if you know the keywords for your roles and for your industries, that's a great start. But then really look at a specific job post. And this is why, you know, you might have 10 to 20 different versions of your resume here with minor tweaks of each one. Uh, but if a job post specifically says, I'm looking for an expert in Adobe Photoshop, you better make sure that your resume hits on those keywords in some fashion. Somewhere in there, they want to see that. Um, and again, not having that, you just might be doing yourself a huge disservice and wasting your time because that ATS is what's going to block you from even getting in front of the right person. Okay. Um, right now, you know, there's, I think you could extend this to small to medium businesses, but over 98% of Fortune 500 companies surveyed would say, yeah, we use ATS. And, um, you know, even as a small business owner here, we use it. We use Indeed. That's our number one go-to. That's a form of an applicant tracking system. It allows me to look for keywords, look for requirements. If people aren't hitting on them, you know, I might not ever actually see the resume. So uh, it's something that almost all businesses use today. The actual resume now. Okay, so if we, we know that the keywords are probably the most important thing on your resume. You should be thinking about that before you ever even get to this step. But now that you've thought about it, now we need to look at the specifics of what's included. Okay, so from an overview, kind of going in order here, first you want to show your basic info. They have to know how to get a hold of you. You don't need to put too much in that section because if they want to talk to you, you're probably applying through an applicant tracking system like Indeed. And they're going to use that to get a hold of you or just a simple phone number and email. That's plenty for them to find you. Knowing your personal address is not really relevant in most scenarios. Um, next, your per uh, professional work experience. That's the most important section of the entire resume. We'll talk more about that in a second. If there are other volunteer or experiences that are directly relevant to the job, then you can consider that. I think that is going to be very dependent on your, you as the individual and the job that you're uh, posting for. And if there was anything that you could cut out of all of this right here, that would be the first thing to say, you know, if you need space for the other sections, um, you know, that is not as important as your experience. And then the next one, which is your education. Okay? You have to highlight what education you have, but put in a brief, simple way. And lastly, we end it with skills and interests so that um, you know, people can really see what you have um, kind of just in a list format. So the uh, basic format of what we follow here is on the screen. Um, and again, we'll share this with everyone so you, you can soak this in a little bit more as you need to. Uh, I would look at the number two as potentially optional, number six as optional. Okay, it's kind of like if space permit. Um, because the resume is supposed to answer those questions of what did you do, how did you do it, and uh, et cetera, you know, you want to be focused on the experience the educational background you have and the direct skills that are going to make you a good candidate for this job. So let's look at, you know, the, the number two here for a second. Name and contact, I think is pretty straightforward. Number two, a summary or in our, in our objective. I get that question a lot. You know, should I have a summary? And I see that a lot on, on a kind of uh, beginner's resume, I might call it, someone who's making a resume for the first time. Um, that is something that you really should only include if it's adding some clarity or context. Okay, if it's not adding to your story, 
then you're just repeating yourself. So I think you really want to always be kind of cautious of that. It it's kind of feels like fluff sometimes. You're just adding the summary, but then right below in the experience, if you're saying the exact same things, um, I would much rather you expand on the experiences or your skills or something else and use that space wisely, or just really kind of de design the resume a little bit more efficiently uh, versus adding a summary that doesn't really add anything. Um, and, and just take the time to think about what the person reading your summary would want to know. I mean, that's kind of the point of it. You know, again, if it's just repeating, there's no point to that. Um, but if it's, if it's easy to read, it's memorable, and it, you, you maybe think about like a tagline about yourself, which is sometimes hard for people to do, uh, then it could serve some value. But again, that would be the first thing I would say, you know, that's, that's potentially optional as well. I'll give you a quick example. Okay. So if you're going to include that, you would want to follow like a really simple structure like this. This is not how every, everyone should write it. You know, again, you want to put your own personality to this, but you know, if you want to talk about your background in ABC and how you can help companies improve and then X, Y, Z through one, two, three, you might come out with a statement like you see below. Um, notice how it's one sentence, a little bit of a longer sentence, but it's, it's really trying to keep it as brief as possible. It's hitting on a lot of keywords. Those keywords might not show up as uh, prominently below if in, in certain resumes. So it might help you give some clarity and context to what you've done in the past and how you're going to do that for a company in the future. Okay. Um, so I, I would look at something like that as an example. And if you really don't feel like you can hit on that, it's okay to leave it out. Really, I, I would much rather you not include that. You don't have a way to say something. Okay, um, and if any questions are coming up, just a reminder, you know, throw them in the chat window and, and we'll we definitely will pause here just a little bit to answer some of those. Um, but if we kind of moving our way down that resume, we're, we're now getting into the real meat of things here. Okay, and we're starting to think, well, how can I present my resume in a way that's gonna be very uh, easy to read? It's gonna be well organized. I think those are kind of the key points here. And the way that you do that, just from a design perspective, often has to do with simple alignment. Okay, so you can kind of see in this example resume um, that everything aligns very easy. Remember, it's all about who's going to be reading it on the other end. And it has to be easy for that person to digest. And alignment is one of the key principles of all visual design. It shows some, um, some like subsets of data here. So you can see very easily by this simple alignment and the simple differences of fonts about when a job experience, work experience begins. The uh, different font sizes kind of give you the, the title, the different color gives you the date, and then that indentation and alignment gives us the experience details. So if I was a hiring manager, I was reading through this, I'm going to just skim through this real fast, but I can, my brain can do that quickly because you have provided an easy alignment for me to see it. So it's, again, it's all about that, you have to make it easy for the reader. And all I can say is alignment is one of those things I see constantly on resumes. It's just all over the place. And that just kind of, it's just hard to read. And as soon as it's hard to read, I tend to dismiss it. And I think most hiring people are the same way because there's just too many resumes to read. Things. So that number three of the resume, focus on the work experience or professional experience of that. Uh, section of your resume, there's a couple tips that I've learned over the years that really go a long way, okay? Because it needs to be easier to read and because people who are actually reviewing this tend to skim what you're reading, some things that can really help you here, okay? Number one, the experience itself should be the absolute bulk of your resume. It is more important than anything else. So if you notice that that is not overwhelmingly the the majority of your resume, something's wrong, you need to address that. You want to go in chronolo uh, reverse chronological order. So most recent should be first, going backwards. Typically, I would say like three to four bullet points under each experience in a very short sentence format is what you're going for. Any more than that, 
people aren't reading it. You're just wasting your space, you're wasting your time. You'd rather fill that in with something else. Okay, so really focus on the brevity and the and how you can get that down. And so obviously, if you have ten things you want to talk about, but you only are being asked to show three to four, as I'm I'm saying here, well then which ones do you choose? The ones that are directly relevant to the job. It has to always be about that. And you know, if it's if it's a lot to talk about, well, you still you have to find a way to keep it brief. Okay, so if you just want to really write out full paragraphs and all that, you know, you can't do that because they, they just won't get read. So make sure you keep it brief. Once you get to the interview part, okay, hopefully you use this to get to the interview. That's where you can expand upon it. And when a uh, hiring manager or recruiter asks you, now, what did you do as a senior engineer in this example? Oh, well, let me tell you all about it. And, I, and then you got great stories to tell. And that gives you more of a human personal approach to the job anyway, but that's not what the resume is supposed to do. And the last thing I would say about this experience section, which is uh, maybe the, one of the most important, is that every sentence of these bullet points should start with an action verb in past tense. Okay, so, um, you know, managed, controlled, scheduled, led, organized, that would be ideal. Um, the uh, the idea of you know you are trying to talk about yourself uh, is really important that you you show the actions because again what most hiring managers will do is just skim those verbs quickly and if there's things that jump out of what they're looking for then they'll continue to read you should assume that either, um, your assumption anyway should be that they're not reading past that first word you're talking about the job uh, in terms of the company the title. What did you do? And you know, you know what someone did by that very first action that you took. Everything else is going to be, you know, maybe read in a, a second wave of reviews or it will be discussed in an interview. Uh, here's another great example. This is actually um, the, the next two examples are from a couple of our instructors here uh, at Digital Workshop, you know, and, and he did a nice job of laying everything out. It's very easy, well aligned, and, it, and it's just I think he did a great job of being very brief in his description. You can see he used one bullet point, two bullet points in a lot of cases, uh, maybe highlighting things that are really making him unique when you get down to the middle section there uh, of his, his experience. But it's clean, it's easy, and as a hiring manager, I can go right down that first verb, and I can see, oh, well, he produced, and he composited, and he designed. I understand what he did, and then I can see his skills which are very directly relevant to the job that he was applying for in this case. Sometimes resumes need to really stand out from the competitors. And the way that you can do that is by customizing it for a role or an industry. So this, uh, another one of our, our instructors here, this jumps out dramatically from other resumes because it's so visual and it's so graphic. Well, guess what? He was applying for a graphic design instructor position. So it, it works so well in that sense. Now it's a very unique layout. You know, it's not something I expect everybody to be able to do. Um, but you should incorporate some uh, design elements when you can. And that could be simple color, simple um, icons, and some different, uh, different layout like you kind of see here. Okay, so if I was hiring someone for a design position, what's the first thing I'm gonna ask for? I want to see your design skills. And usually it's going to be, I'm going to ask you for a portfolio. Well, this is a, this was a great way. I thought a really creative way for him to get those design skills in front of me right at that resume level. And, you know, he's been a great instructor for us for many years now as well. Okay, so we've kind of worked our way through and we, we've got the experience, we've got uh, you know, the education, the skills, all these things. Now it's time for you to really go backwards and start to fine tune your resume. Okay, I think one of the most important things that people really overlook is that this resume is a living document. Okay, it needs to answer these questions. Where on your resume would your eyes be drawn to? If you're not finding the same answers that you think a hiring manager would find well, then you're, you maybe need to make some tweaks to it, reorganize some content, improve that alignment. If you were that person, what would you be looking for? You can put yourself in the shoes of someone who would be hiring you and try to see if you, you're answering that. 
if someone is reading top to bottom through your resume, they want to know that um, you know you are emphasizing the things that are most important. And if we only have that 10 seconds as like a general guideline, well then yeah, the things at the top need to be the most important. And that's why sometimes I also think that summary can be omitted. It's, it's not doing its job here of, of helping tell the story right at the very beginning. Um, go back and fine tune that work experience. Okay, I do that by going and looking at the very specific job posting and look at your resume. And is there a connection? In other words, does your resume directly speak to the posting by the keywords, by the way that you presented the data? It does it show that similar experience. And if not, is there a way that you're able to, to flip that around and show that you're capable of doing this job and doing it very well? You have to get that message across somehow. So it's really important that you go back and you make sure that every single posting that you do that. If you just keep applying with the same resume to every kind of job, well, you're going to be missing the mark on a lot of the jobs. So just keep editing and refining, editing and refining, and just think about it as a living document until you finally land in the job. If you're not getting callbacks or interviews, something in those keywords, something in the experience, something in the layout needs to be adjusted. Okay, so if you, you try it for a week or two and you're not seeing any results, don't be afraid to make changes. You have to keep trying and adjusting that resume because the resume is your calling card for people to actually notice you. And if they're not noticing you, my, you know, nine times out of 10, it is a poor resume, either in the design or the way that you're describing yourself. And I would never, ever tell you to lie on your resume that you absolutely should not do that. However, I would tell you to be very creative with the wording about how you describe yourself. Don't be afraid to try a whole different approach to changing your resume about how you would describe a position or what you did on the job. Okay, you need to be creative and more importantly, you need to be aligned to those keywords. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that you know I do and and as a school that we do, we do include resume reviews with every single one of our certificate programs here. And if you need more help, if you're trying to figure out what, what else can I do after you, you take this and you absorb all this information, I know this is a lot, uh, then you know you can go and, and look at um, improving your resume. If you're an existing student and you're attending here, you know, you do get this included. If you're a prospective student, you know, that's something we can talk to you about. I would also encourage you to go to your local county workforce center. We have a lot of classes, most of them obviously are online right now, uh, if not all of them. And um but there's a lot of free resources there that are typically free for everyone in the community. Um, they can help you with your resume and get some more review and feedback. LinkedIn is an obvious um, source for a lot of uh, information as well. They have great articles, um, tips, resources. You can even hire a, res a resume pro if you want to go that route uh, through LinkedIn as well. So, you know, I think uh, you've got a lot to think about, all of you here, in terms of getting uh, the next steps of your resume. Uh, but that doesn't need to be the, the end all be all. Um, and I was really happy actually that just this morning, one of our current students got back to me and, and after the latest resume review, you know, he did went from getting zero uh, response to his resume. All of a sudden he he's, was really excited to announce he's got a couple uh, resumes that are being noticed. He's got a couple interviews coming up. So it does work. You do have to be a little patient. You have to be diligent about it. But these, these um, are kind of some tried and true methods of getting people to pay attention. Um, so, with that in mind, I do want to pause and just kind of go to the chat window here, um, and I'm going to go through some of these questions. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pull that up. Okay. So, um, from Kate, um, I'm changing careers. Does it, does it make sense to list skills first? Um, Honestly, no, I really don't think that's what most people are going to look for. The experience is always what they want to know. Um, if you can list your, your, your skills as part of that, I think that could be helpful. Um, I, I think that, you know, if you're changing careers, you do have that obstacle of, well, how do I show experience if I don't have any yet? Well, you've got to somehow get creative with something you've done in the past, whether that is maybe more from a soft skills perspective, things like you managed, you organized, you, um, you're administrative, 
uh, anything like that that can highlight how you can still be valuable to the team and how you're you maybe in the process of uh, an educational perspective or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I really feel like experience should always be something you're trying to talk about first. Um, that could be also where a summary statement is really useful. That'd be the other time I might use that to say like why you're changing careers. And that'd be a great addition to the story that might not be available from your current experience. Say that you're changing it because blank or you're, you know, you're targeting these jobs, you have a passion for X, Y, Z. And that, I think that could be, uh, you know, a really useful way of doing that. Okay. Um, Sarah asked three questions. All right, so does quirky over design resumes actually catch the attention of recruiters who stand better? Well, in a creative field, I think they do absolutely catch the attention of people. Um, it, if I'm hiring from someone who's a designer, what's the best way for me to know that they can design? Well, show me your resume. That's the first thing that I would pay attention to. Um, there is some kind of balance there of legibility and readability. I think the one I showed you, he did a really nice job of keeping it very legible, but it is a very quirky layout. So I did, you know, my brain had to work a little harder to follow what he was telling me. Some people might not like that. So I think, you know, there, there are some who might argue that point a little bit. Um, but in a creative field, I mean, I really feel like that is a great way to stand out from the pack versus just kind of some plain text of, you know, I'm, uh, I'm qualified to use Illustrator or Photoshop. Um, and the other one I showed you, by the way, that was um, that had more video skills on it. I mean, that's a very creative field as well. So he did maybe the, the other way of, you know, it's a very plain text kind of resume, but it still had a nice designed um, feel to it. How important is it to send a portfolio? Um, I think it's, it's something they're going to ask for. Um, yeah, you might just need to really look at the job posting. I don't know that you would want to send it up front because most people are not going to pay attention to it until they want to actually talk to you. So you could usually put a little small text that says portfolio available upon request, or you could include it in your cover letter. That's another place to get in some of that information, a nice link to a portfolio if you have it. Um, but remember that people are skimming through these resumes. So putting a link to it, I would say the majority of people, they're not going to click it and they're going to probably ignore that. So it's just kind of taking up some space. But if you can creatively get it in there and not take up too much space, um, you know, I guess it, it couldn't hurt to kind of make it available in different ways. Um, so I would personally would say either find a different place for it or wait for them to ask. Um, make sure that, you, you know, but saying that it's available or telling them that is useful too. Um, how, where would you include a place for information to elaborate on a gap in employment? Um, well, you know, again, I, I feel like that's something that's just going to come up naturally. You don't need to elaborate. It, it's not something that you want to highlight. If there's a gap in employment and someone sees that, they're going to say, oh, that's one of the first questions that hopefully you get in an interview. Well, why did you take so many years off? You have an easy answer. You have a great story to tell. Um, so I, I don't know that you need to elaborate on it at all. I, I don't think I would. Um, if there was a massive gap, I mean, you know, it's, I, I don't even know what that number would be, but um, maybe in a cover letter, that would be the place where you could discuss how you're getting back into the workforce or that summary statement again. You could say you're looking for opportunities as you re-enter the workforce. But again, use the interview as the time to explain the gaps and the and the things like that. Don't highlight anything that you would think wouldn't be completely about the job, though. I always focus on those. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, let me suggest we jump ahead because there's a question that kind of piggybacks piggybacks off of that last question. Um, it's yeah. Last question from James. He said, "I'm trained to get a foot in the door with." A professional career and don't have a lot of long-term experience how should i approach work experience that was highly relevant but short term well that's a good question too i mean again you you have to kind of play with the cards that you have right and, and, and play your hand a little bit um the fact that it's short term doesn't mean it wasn't experience you know and again if you can highlight what what did you do in that short amount of time uh, I still feel like you're going to prove your value to an employer. Um, 
it's something that will probably come up in, a, in an interview. You know, someone would say, well, how come all these positions are six months long or something of like that effect? Um, so you better have a really good answer for that and be able to explain yourself. But I don't, I don't think it discounts it anymore. I think you want to, it actually in some ways might fill in the resume to have a few extra uh, experiences along the way. The more experience you can show, it just shows that you're out there trying to succeed in this field. So I, I feel like it's, um, I, I don't think like short term is really a problem. So, um, cool. Thanks. And then yeah. um, there's a little bit of conversation. So jumping to the next question would be from Juan. Um, he said, if the job I was going for was something I did five years ago, and my most recent position has no relevance, how would I frame that? If the job you're going for was five years ago, well, um, I, I mean, if the recent position shows employment, okay, so it shows that you're still been in the workforce, I think that's really useful to know, but maybe you just keep that one slightly more Brief and, and again, think about the vertical space of what you're showing someone. You're showing that you're employed, and you want to talk about something there that was relevant. Hopefully, you can find something. If and then the next one would be from five years ago, that would be much more directly relevant, and that might be a little bit longer because you want to talk about how you do have experience in whatever you're applying for. Um, so I would frame it like that, and, and so it still shows you've had you know nice continuous employment. There's not a gap if you. You know, didn't have to show that or, or didn't have to happen. Uh, but that the, um, the, yeah, the, the five-year-old position was, was the relevant one. So it just would bring more attention to that, I hope. And then, and again, in an interview, someone might say, well, you know, what were you doing at these different jobs? Uh, and you'd be able to talk about all of them confidently, but you would still want to continue to highlight that one that is directly relevant to the one that you're looking at. Okay, I think we got a couple, we'll time for a couple more. Uh, if you've got others you want to point out. Yeah, we've got one from Jordan here. He said, how do I admit years of short-lived retail food service jobs while still projecting customer service skills, especially when that makes up 75% of my work history? Well, okay, so if I knew the exact jobs you were going for, I could answer that more directly. But let's just say that... Uh, the, the customer service, you know, you, well, you touched on this, how you project the customer service. Any retail or food is dealing with people. And anytime you're dealing with people, that is customer service. So you need to find a way to figure out, like, how, how can you discuss, um, you know, like how you dealt with difficult situations. I feel like that's something that people would want to see. So especially in food, okay, if you were on the front of the house and you had to deal with difficult customers, I mean, that's something that you could talk about in retail, someone who may, you know, was, was causing a stink about something in the store and, and was, uh, you know, being a, a difficult customer. How did you deal with that? Um, I think that kind of shows a little bit of the interpersonal skills that a lot of people are looking to hire for. Um, he was going of, for sorry, Stu, if he's going for graphic design, how does he kind of tailor that? If that helps answer the question. Well, so where I was kind of going with that is, you know, a lot of hiring managers would, would look at the soft skills that you bring to the table as a huge part of this. And some would even say they're going to hire you for the soft skills and then look at the technical skills or the hard skills. Now, there's a balance there. I mean, you have to have the hard skills they're looking for. If, if you're going for graphic design, they need to see that you have some experience or education in design. And then, of course, it's a design field, so you need to have a portfolio going. Um, but People want to know that you worked well on a team, that you dealt with difficult situations, that you have good communication skills. If you can highlight that through retail and food service, and then also bring in some of these, um, you know, design um, uh, experiences or education in some way, I feel like that actually would would speak very really well to a lot of people. Because if you work well on a team, and I want to hire you. Uh, a big part of it is I want to know that you're going to work well with my existing team, right? So um, I feel like it's something you, um, it, it could be framed in a way that's really positive. When you don't have any design experience, I know that's always a little tricky, you know, because 
um, you know, you say, well, I've never worked professionally uh, as a designer. I get that question all the time, but I mean, that's really, then you need to create some opportunities, um, whether that is uh, going out and trying to get some work really inexpensively, you're doing some work for friends or for family, or just doing it for yourself and really creating those opportunities to say, you know, for your own business, I've got uh, some portfolio pieces and I have worked with clients. I've worked with the, you know, the customer service aspect of being a designer and gone through that design process. So um, that's always tough, but I think you can actually get around that with design careers by creating your own opportunities and finding the work a little bit uh, yourself. So, so some of my personal projects and school projects could count for portfolio pieces in theory. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. In, but, anything, oh anything that shows your design skills is, should be part of it. I mean, okay. I, I think if it's something, if it's something like in school, you know, there's some exercise I know that we do that, you know, everybody might be doing. Um, but if you have anything that's unique that you've made, whether it doesn't matter where you made it, I think that's something you want to highlight. Yeah. It's just, there's so many jobs there that I just like, It'd be a really big list of of those those if customer need, service jobs. If you need help like building portfolio pieces, something that I've done in the past is just write things down and throw them in a hat and then just pull one out and design it, whatever it is, whether you know, it could be like a restaurant logo and then you just make up a company and design a logo for a fictitious business. Like, That's a great idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. I hadn't thought yeah. about it in that way. Think about um, uh, well, some good, if you want to try to get some, some things in your portfolio for everybody here, you know, try to connect with the local nonprofit. I could almost guarantee you that you know, nonprofits need design work constantly and they can't afford it, any smaller one anyway. So they would love your help and it would give you an opportunity to build your portfolio. You could go to the small business development centers and work with small businesses. They're also struggling, especially right now, and they would love your help with some free work or I never want to say free, I shouldn't say that, but inexpensively, you could offer it a very low cost for the sole purpose of building your resume. And then as you know, that, that same point, just keep designing. So if you can't find that and you just want to keep going, just, you know, think of something you love. You know, if you're a video gamer, think of a new video game you want to create and then start creating an ad campaign around it, create the logo, create the poster, etc. If you like food, uh, pick a food, uh, a type of food that you like and a restaurant you like and kind of start doing the work on their behalf, even if they didn't ask you to do it. And that would help build it up too. Okay. Cool. I think we have time for maybe like one more question if there are any more, Allie. Yeah, we've got a couple more. Um, do you think we could squeeze in two? Yeah, more? sure. So okay, the, I'll go to the shorter one. Um, what is the best resume format that would work to submit on ATS, so like a PDF, Word doc, which file format? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, most people will ask for either one of those and they should be just fine. Um, I think the most important thing is pay attention to what they're asking for. If they ask you for PDF and you give them a Word doc, then you're, you're gonna get weeded out real fast. But those two formats are the most common and typically they're fine. I would say, in my experience, PDF is going to be the preferred format simply because it's not editable. So when you submit something that's a Word doc, uh, not that anybody would do this, but it is possible that it could get edited by accident. Um, so, uh, but they're both searchable, even though those documents are searchable. Um, and something like Indeed is really important that you really pay attention to. Um, they should be able to show you, you know, what your public profile looks like when you submit your resume because you want to see what the hiring manager is seeing and often it comes in as kind of like uh, text fields that, that are just kind of really simple and the same for everybody and then they give you the opportunity to uh, allow your resume to be downloaded so you know you want to really make sure that you have both of those filled out well um, but if people are just asking for resumes and saying submit the resume to you know this site or this um, email um, just just read the directions but either one of those should be good Cool. Thanks, Stu. Um, and then I know we've got a couple more, but I'm going to hear from someone we haven't answered to. So I'm going to pick Kate's last question. Um, she said, I spent three years teaching English in Asia, two different countries, three different schools. 
The experiences included a couple promotions and teacher training, which is highly relevant to her new field. Should she list the these under one heading since they're so similar or separate them to highlight professional growth and leadership? Well, that's a great question. Um, if the title or the um, maybe direct responsibility changed, then I think separating them out would be useful. Uh, I guess I would also say that, um, well, I mean, if it's truly a promotion, I, I do think you want to show that. I, I, I think you want to show the growth that you, that shows that you were recognized, you were, you, your career grew within this company. So however you need to do that, I do think that would be really important. Um, the teacher training, I don't know that that's as relevant because it's something you were uh, attending or you were maybe doing as part of your, your job. But um, without knowing the specifics of that, I, I think that might just be kind of listed in that skills and relevant experience. But the actual experience of the job is what somebody wants to see. They want, they want to see that you were hired to do F, uh, ABC, and this is what you're going to bring ABC to my company too. The teacher training, although I, I certainly can understand that to change for different kinds of positions. Um, I think you might want to just like list it out in education or an experience, but I don't know if I would put it in the, uh, I mean, like developing experience. and leading, like training other teachers. Um, right. So if it's like a specific workshop or something, you, your teacher training you've attended, I, I feel like that would be under like your kind of educa education umbrella or relevance experience. You might make a separate section since yours is a little unique. Um, like you know, some people have, hobbies and interests, you know, that kind of section, I, I think yours would be, uh, it, it, it sounds like to me like either education or relevance, but it's not really like professional experience. So it, you can frame it maybe either way, because that is unique, but that's, that's my first thought on it. Okay, well, with the last few minutes, because I want to be respectful of everyone's time, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things here as we wrap up. Um, you know, so one of the things that we do with all of our students, um, you know, when we have certificate students, anyway, um, we do look at that career focus. So all of our programs are very hyper-focused on one, um, uh, specific set of skills or another. Um, some of these are more tech related. Some of these are going to be more soft skill related. Um, but if you're interested in learning any more about these, you know, career coaching is included in all of these. Um, so feel free to reach out. These are the areas that we currently have certificates available. And so to kind of that same point of what you're asking about, like teacher training, you know, you'd be able to be certified in a specific area and that can be uh, really valuable there. Um, our track record of success has been really high in the last so many years. Um, 82% of our unemployed students moving on to employment. It's a nice um, increase in salary from our graduates. So you know, those are stats that we're very proud of. And, and again, if you are interested, uh, we'd be happy to talk more about it. There's a lot that's included in each one of those programs, not just the career counseling, but um, you do real world projects that's building your portfolio and um, you know, real world application of what you're learning. And we really include small classes with support and mentoring the whole time as well. Um, typically when I talk about that, most people say, well, how can I afford to pay for it? We do have some creative ways of, uh, of actually getting uh, your education and right now there is a tech skills scholarship that's available for those programs that you can apply for the needs-based scholarship that's available. So, um, you know, all of this will be made available. We'll, we'll have this PDF sent to you and uh, you can also get the recording. Uh, here's a couple quick links and my information will be in here. All this information will, you'll get when you get the email. If you have any questions or you want to talk more about what we do or how uh, the resumes you know, can be continued to improve, uh, certainly reach out. If you are an existing student, you have not already set up a resume review, uh, you can talk to Allie about that as well. And she'll help you get that coordinated and start that process. Um, so, you know, that's uh, pretty much right on time. I think we got two minutes left, but thank you all very much for meeting with me here. I do really appreciate you joining us. Um, I hope you got some good tips out of it and um, enjoy the rest of your day. And we will hopefully talk to you all very soon. We'll be doing this again, I think, in the near future with some more professional development kind of workshop. So, um, yeah, thanks and talk with you soon.